Oh, the Pfizer. Thank you. Good evening, folks. Welcome back to Real Abilities. My name is Isaac Sablaki. I'm director and co-founder of the Real Abilities Film Festival. Thank you so much for joining us. This is the Q&A for Shorts 3. We've been running Q&As for our short films all day um, and have yet another session of amazing short films tomorrow. Um, so please be sure to check out all the amazing short films. All our Q&As are recorded and placed online by the next day. So you could check out all the Q&As with all the fabulous filmmakers from these amazing films. Every year we have amazing films for shorts. This year, clearly four sections of shorts just shows you how many wonderful films there are. I should note, of course, that we have live transcript for this event. Um, so to click on the live transcript button on the bottom of the screen will get you um, the captions. So you can use those. Um, and of course, all of our films, we are proud to say, have um, open captions and audio description available as well. Um, we are here for Shorts 3, and I want to give a big thank you to all of our amazing partners for this entire festival. Um, but most specifically for this program, I'm going to highlight um, Team Fox, um, Action Play, Barrier Free Living, City Access New York, um, Cole Kid, um, Health Advocacy, Health Ad Advocacy Summit, excuse me, Kaiser's Room, um, and our good friends at Music for Autism. Um, of course, for all of our panels, um, we are grateful to Vimeo for being our conversation sponsor for this year and, um, and, and a good friend of the festival in general. Um, I'm really excited. I find, of course, the short films to be some of the best films that we have. And um, some of the, you know, you get in a package just so many diverse films. And this is a great example of them. And I think um, I give credit to our team here at the Real Abilities Film Festival. I've been following these packages all day and they're making so much sense to me how these films really complement each other and work together really nicely. Um, for the Q&A right now, um, we will be featuring um, speakers from, and I'll introduce them. And if everybody can just say hi, as I mention your name, um, we have from the film, Hal, Hal and Minter. We have Hal and Minter. Hi folks. Hi. <laughs> and we have the filmmaker as well, um, Ram Divineni. Ram? Hello. How's it going? Um, then from the film Karen, we have um, the director, Colin Parr. Colin, thank you so Hello. much for being here. We have um, the subject, who you'll know very well, um, Myron Dial. Hi. And we have Ryan Rambach, uh, the co-producer of the film. Hey, guys. Then from the film Coexist, we have Camille Sohaili, if I pronounce that correctly. Hi, Camille. Yes, hello. Hi. Where are you coming in from, by the way? Yes. Camille? Where are you coming in from right now? Excuse me, can you repeat the question? I couldn't hear. Where are you coming in from? Where am I from? Where, where are you right now? I'm, I'm right now, I'm in South Korea. I'm Iranian, but now I'm in South Korea. It's uh, 7 a.m. now. 7 a.m., okay, not too early. Thank you, thank you for, <laughs> for getting up. <laughs> Hope you had your coffee. Um, <laughs> and then we have from the film Strange, you'll recognize him as well, Cameron Carr. Cameron, thank you so much for being here. Howdy, thank you for having me. Thank you all. Um, folks, if we wanna make you a part of this conversation, so please, if you have any questions, put them in the chat. If you can't put them in the chat, raise your hand and we'll call on you. Um, if you put them in the chat, we'll call on you and open up your mic so you could ask, ask the questions live. Um, and let me jump right in. Um, and first I'm gonna start with a couple of questions to all of you and I'll call on you as we, as we go around. Um, but I would love to know just 
um, what led you to to make your films? Um, what inspired you, and what led to this for to this process to happen? Um, and let me start with Cameron. Oh, all right. Uh, hello, my name is Cameron. I I am the director, animator, and editor of Strange, and also the voice actor and the star of the show. But it's not just about myself. Uh, the reason why I half the reason why I made the film was uh, not just to um, basically explain a little bit about myself, like an autobiographical piece, uh, like how I cope with everyday life. It's also actually an extension about my friends and the, the importance of friendship. It's almost a tribute to them and my time at uni. I'm in my third year. I'm doing my grad film, as you can see, this little buddy here, and uh, I'll be graduating soon. So it'll be a big change for me. Thank you. Um, let me come to the, um, to the Karen team now. Um, Colin, do you wanna start? Yeah, so Ryan and I met Myron almost 10 years ago now. We were students in college and we were studying, starting to study filmmaking. And um, I think both of us, Myron's art and his story really spoke to us. And um, we saw a chance to create something really unique. It was, um, it was important to me to, I wanted to show Myron's experience with epilepsy in kind of, kind of a new way and really make, try to make people feel what it's, what it's like to sort of go through these experiences. Um, so that was a really important um, goal of mine and was kind of the driving force of everything we did while we were making the film. Ryan, did you want to add? Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we were just trying, you know, um, Myron's uh, experience, you know, with his epilepsy is such a personal thing that I think it's probably hard for people to other people to understand what he's gone through so I think our objective was to try to visually show uh you know the struggle and all how he was able to overcome the struggles um in the film so that was really I think our main objective I, I will note also that I think in our 13 years of real abilities, this is our first film about epilepsy then from, from my memory um, that we've uh, featured. And we always try to diversify and bring in uh, other, other films and other um, topics and other disabilities that we haven't really touched on. And uh, thank you for, for making, making this. And, and of course, to all of you. Um, yeah, thank you for uh, having us. Of course. Um, let's uh, hear from, uh, from Ram at the uh, Hal and Inter team. Yes, hi. Um, well, I, I knew Hal almost 20 years now. Um, I actually ran a, a poetry magazine and Hal is a poet and I published his work. And um, at that stage, 20 years ago, he was, I think in the beginning stages or had epilep I'm sorry, had Parkinson's, but was not public about it. And um, when I learned about you know, I wasn't even making films 20 years ago. So when I learned and when I was getting into documentaries, how story kept resonating in my head because his voice and the persona that he created is so unique in the poetry world. And I found it very curious that a person with Parkinson's, how they can be creative, but in a sense, lose their physical voice, but not their internal voice. And that's why I wanted to make that documentary. Thank you. And um, really, a, uh, spoke to me very, very personally, too. Um, uh, I, I, think, I think my mother's in there somewhere, too. Um, mm -hmm. And um, um, Camille from uh, Coexist, can you share a little bit about uh, why you want yes, to? Yes, I think the, thing, the most important thing that moved me forward about this project was as soon as I met this, this character, the main character of the documentary, Della, he's I found a blind man who is going go fishing and uh, he could communicate. Uh, I heard a lot that when people lost, uh, for example, sight, they can hear more, they, other senses became more powerful, but I never experienced it personally so vividly. So this man could hear the sound of fish in the water. And I couldn't believe it uh, till I went to the boat and I could see that he is directing uh, the boat where to go and where to fish. And he was an amazing person. 
as soon as I met him, I knew that I need to follow his life for a while. And I'm very glad that I had this opportunity because soon after our movie, he passed away and this footage became one of the, I mean, last images of him. And it's very hard, at least in my experience, at least in that island, to meet anyone, any uh, like deep character like him. And I'm very glad that I had this opportunity to learn from him. Um, thank you. Thank you for sharing that and for bringing your films. All of you, I mean, are really, it's, they are such beautiful films. Um, I wanted to also bring um, uh, Myron and Helen Minter into the conversation as far as from your perspective. Um, uh, how, did, how did it look like the, when the project started for you? Were you, uh, were you saying, sure, let's, uh, let's, let's just, were you, were you an easy um, a character to cast or um, um, what were your hopes with making this film? Is that towards me? Um, I'll start with you, Myron. Okay. <clears throat> well, um, by the time I met Colin, <clears throat> um, I'd been outed uh, for epilepsy uh, about at 50 years old. You know, I'd had it for ever since I was four years old. And um, I'd already been on the board of directors of the Epilepsy Foundation and the Washington uh, board as well. And, and I, in other words, I'd come out. And, uh, and when I say that, I mean it. Because uh, most people who have epilepsy who are professionals, if they come out, they're gone. And that includes actors, directors, musicians, you name it. And um, when I was approached to do this film, uh, I'd already been in the art world for quite some time and shown all over the world. So, uh, and since I was on the board of directors of the Epilepsy Foundation, I, I had a lot of inter interaction with, with doctors and, and patients and children who had epilepsy and their stories were just heartbreaking, just heartbreaking. And I got a chance, I think, with Colin and Ryan and the others, <clears throat> to, to show just a little bit of what somebody with epilepsy goes through, because epilepsy is actually many things, it's not just one thing. And so um, in 12 minutes, you don't say too much about a disease that affects 2% of the population. But anyway, the point is that when they approached me, I, I jumped at the chance to, uh, to go public with epilepsy and to talk about it and ex you know, exchange my experiences because believe me before that um, I didn't I, I kept quiet for 50 years I didn't let anybody know that I had epilepsy or would I I would not even admit that I had it hell I got in the army <laughs> so anyway, that's that's pretty much the reason that, that I got involved with the project is it was another aspect like you said you'd never had anybody about epilepsy uh, in your film festival. And I, that was just sort of shocking to me because so many people have it. So that's my answer. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's so important to break down these stigmas and we believe that film is a great way to do it and, um, uh, and bring this to the public. And thank you. Thank you for being so brave with this. Um, Hal and Minter helped me. So, sorry to always refer to you as one, but you're there on one screen. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, Let's, let's hear from you a little bit from your perspective about, uh, about getting involved with this film. Um, how are you going to start? Yeah. So Ram approached me um, about this project. And I thought, um, you know, I, I, I have complete trust in him. And, and I didn't interfere in the movie because it's important to be an author. My friend is that uh, good, but um, but um, there's a, a, a new new book came out about disability, and I'm the only one who wrote about um, Parkinson. I know, like we would say, like when they were saying about epilepsy, is is secret, is hidden. You're not supposed to go up to someone and say, hi, I'm epileptic. Um, that will get you in hot water. 
I think I think um, that um, we, as Hal said, we had total trust in Ram, and it was actually really exciting to see the the filmmaking, the creative process, because you know Hal and I are both writers, and just seeing how close, how just seeing the process was fascinating. Um, and but I think most importantly, um, I we really wanted, we knew that our stories were especially that how that our stories would be inspiring to others and I think that we saw because we had started reading how we would read his uh, poetry in public you know we go to like hospitals and things and conferences and things like that and there was always such an amazing response I mean and people were just so uplifted by him and by his poetry and and um so I knew the film would do that, and I think it has. And I and I just thank Ram for no, seeing our story and the importance of it. And I think it's very healing and inspiring for others. So, so um, that's what I have to say. So let me let me ask. This is another question, really, for everyone, and we'll hear from you one by one. Your films are all about more than disability, which is what we like about them. Yet they all, um, of course, have a very uh, um, uh, inclusive um, part to them as well. And um, I want to know what you hoped that the impact of your films would be on audiences. Um, choosing, knowing that you're choosing a short film format which, um, which reaches people in a certain way. Um, but really, what was your goal with the film um, as far as your hopes that this will, this is what it's going to do to an audience. Um, Ram, can we start with you this time? Sure. Um, I mean, I, I really wanted to sh showcase the creativity. Uh, I mean, you can have a disability like Parkinson's or any other disability, but your mind can be very free and liberating. And uh, I think that really comes out in the movie. Like, uh, even though how may have lost sort of the, his speaking voice or it's been changed. It, creatively, I mean, I just saw him all the time writing. And I also wanted to show this beautiful synergy, this beautiful romance between uh, Howe and Minter, which you know, they've been married for 20 some odd years. And um, Minter is very much a critical part, not only in Howe's life, but in the creative life that they both share together, which I, I, I just found it admirable and beautiful. Thank you. Hello, Minter, did you want to add to that as far as the impact of a film and your hopes for the impact? Um, I just, in, just in, we, we, you see a lot of depression in Parkinson's, a lot of people that, um, that have, that are really struggling. I've, and, 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 and I think that, um, I think being, um, the, the, the ins uplifting people and, and inspiring others. And, you know, actually Hal has really, believe it or not, Hal actually sees it as a gift um, um, in a way that, and I think Michael J. Fox says the same thing. And, and, um, and, and I asked him one day, why is it that you see it as a gift? Um, and he said, because of all the people I've met. Um, so, so, which is an amazing thing for him to say, really. Um, so I think, I think, um, th th and there's humor, like, you know, Hal had a very difficult mother. So he's still writing about his mother. <laughs> I mean, he wrote a book about, but I think, um, and so many people came up to him after, you know, when he would read poems about his mother and say, I had a difficult mother too. You're writing about my mother. Well, now he's writing about the part, he writes about the Parkinson's. And I think that, um, that that's you know it's a diff it's a different kind of difficulty that he had in his life and so I think it it it, it and one thing that's interesting about Parkinson's is just that a lot of people find themselves becoming creative um, once they've had Parkinson's which is fascinating to me um, from a brain perspective anyway so I think I don't know if that answers your question but thank you thank you. Um, I'm going to move on to Colin now, as far as the um, impact of your film and your hopes for that. Yeah, I think a, a lot like 
rum and um, how I'm into it. I wanted to, um, first of all, you know, showcase the Myron, Myron's creativity and um, just kind of the, um, the gift that his art is to the world um, and to show, you know, through the challenges he had earlier in his life by kind of um, embracing this part of him um, and, and, you know, showing, showing it to all of us that, you know, we can learn and be changed by it as well. Um, so that was really important to me. And the other thing was just to create a really moving experience with some of the, the, the filmmaking, filmmaking techniques. Ryan, did you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, just sort of what Myron was touching on, part of it was, you know, epilepsy is such a stigmatized condition, especially, I mean, it's very, going back like thousands of years in the history of the world, but I guess, you know, we were just trying to destigmatize it, you know, for people and, um, you know, because like Myron said, it's like, it's sort of more common as neurological conditions go, you know, worldwide, like 50 to 70 million people or something, so uh I guess that was, you know, that's what we were trying to do. And the other thing was just showing this amazing artwork and um, trying to make sort of a cinematic uh, film. Cause I think, you know, you could say the film is somewhat experimental but it also has some very sort of conventional um, sort of cinematic uh, qualities to it in terms of the soundtrack and, and how certain things were executed. Thank you. My Myron, did you want to add on to that? Yeah. <clears throat> um... I mean, I, when I was uh, four years old, I was in a coma, and I was in a coma for like two or three months. Yeah, that's never been really uh, cauterized. But the fact of it is, is that my parents thought I was demon possessed, so they were beating the devil out of me. So I was abused for about seven or eight years, uh, being beaten uh, by my folks for religious reasons. Because um, I thought I was demon possessed, because that's what it says in Matthew and Mark. <clears throat> and uh, so I went under. I just stopped telling people that I had seizures. And if I had them, I would go in a closet and have them by myself and then clean up myself afterwards. And, and uh, I mean, today, of course, they could never get away with what they got away with back in the 1940s. Because um, as soon as some teacher saw my legs, which were bloody, they would have uh, they would have been at the door very quickly. But anyway, um, remember I was born in the 1940s, so they didn't know much about epilepsy in the 1940s. In fact, they don't know that much about it right now. And there's like five or six or seven different kinds of seizures that people don't even know about. And um, education is the key to any. Uh, any condition that is that is abstract and epilepsy is something that's hard to pin down. You know, I mean, it's not like you have a bad arm and you're crippled or something. You know, but uh, the crippling nature of epilepsy is so terrible. Uh, it affects every part of your being. There's nothing that you do that epilepsy doesn't affect. Um, and I started out started out as a child, but I actually started out as a musician and I went to school to be a musician and all the rest of it. And then I turned to art because inside of my brain, I would see these visions because my epilepsy resides in, in the visual cortex. And I made a start making record of, the, of those experiences by drawing the pictures of them. And it's now 7,000 works later. Uh, and 35 years later. And um, I've made sculptures, paintings, drawings, and I, we've shown all over the world with this work and talked about epilepsy in particular. And um, only the last thing I'd like to say is that um, when we used to have these children programs for camps, because children can't go to regular camps uh, if they have seizures, they, they're not allowed. So we had our own camps at uh, the Epilepsy Foundation. And I was shocked 
and how little doctors knew what they were talking about. And, uh, and so I went to them and explained, guys, you don't know what you're talking about. You know, doctors don't like to hear that. And uh, a lot of things have changed over the last 30 or 40 years. There's like nine or 10 anti-convulsive drugs now, and there used to be two. And there's all kinds of new products and stuff, but they still do not know how it works or why it works or anything else. Um, so I think that, that for the public to understand what epileptics go through, this film helps explain that a little bit. It's a little confusing in some ways, but it also explains a lot. And then of course, podcasts are wonderful. And what you guys do is wonderful. I mean, it's educational. And it's just essential that 2% of the population needs to be found out about, talked about, and accepted. And that's my goal. And it's always been my goal to, to uh, educate the, the, uh, the uneducated about this illness is actually a condition. And then see how people react to people that they live with or know. I mean, almost everybody I know has somebody who has epilepsy. It's really interesting. When I mention it, somebody goes, oh yeah, my cousin had epilepsy or my dog had epilepsy. Somebody, somebody just mentioned it in the chat here. Yeah. yeah, I mean, dogs have the same condition that we do. Yeah. And so anyway, the, the, the educational part was something I took up uh, after my retirement as a, an executive in telecommunications. And, um, and I'm still at it. I'm 77 now, and, and, uh, but I am still actively involved in educating the world about, uh, about this particular condition. Thank and, you. Uh, that's, that's pretty much the story. Camille, let me, let me ask you um, the same question. What, uh, what was your hope that the film, how would, would imp how would you hope the film would impact audiences? Mm -hmm. Um, I am actually very happy you brought up this question because um, like talking with you in this festival with audience was actually a hope, a dream that I had uh, when I entered Hormoz Island the very first time to shot this uh, movie. Because uh, especially uh, not, not just because this is a festival for disability movies, but also it's a festival that now happening in the USA. And uh, uh, Hormoz Island is a place that you might be heard a lot in news by not right people. Everyone talks about Hormoz Strait and especially when I was shooting this movie, it was during Trump times and it was even worse. Uh, and uh, I, I, I found it uh, not uh, proper. I, I thought something is missing that everyone, there's just image coming out from Hormoz and it looks like uh, we forget that this, the beauty, the beautiness of the landscapes of this island, the people who are living there. And this kind of talks is always uh, missed in uh, shouts of politicians. And uh, I, I went to the island with a very small group, my brother and a good friend of mine who was a cameraman of this project. And we had this dream that uh, we make a movie that uh, not only like uh, can portray this amazing person, but also can portray a right, the rightest image uh, about this island, about the people of this island, the culture here. And uh, right now I'm here in a festival in uh, New York and with many audience from USA. And this is kind of really uh, a dream that I had. And I hope that uh, this, this small short movie can give this, um, can, uh, from now on, anyone like when we hear Hormoz straight and whatever they said, and I also mentioned it in the movie that in news is always talking that uh, USA something, Iran politicians say something, but we as a people who are living in uh, these countries, we need to, I hope that 
after this movie, people who watch this movie will remember Formos is this amazing island, which this beautiful, deep character, these amazing people are living there. And we always need to put it frontier and we need to remember. And I hope uh, I could do a small thought in. This was my hope. This was my hope that I hope my audience got. For sure, for sure. The imagery was just so breathtaking. I'm sure people uh, will, will forever have a new image of, of uh, I think of Iran in general. Um, I wanna jump back to that in a moment, but let me ask uh, Cameron here. Um, Cameron, just uh, your hopes as far as how the film would impact the audience. Hello again. Um, well, uh, with anything I make, I hope to make a good story, first of all. Um, but if we're talking specifically about the film Strange, uh, there are three things I hope uh, as, uh, people can take away. Uh, firstly, uh, I think that in, in topics like autism, um, I've seen a lot of like autistic like documentaries and short films and stuff like that. And they're usually quite... Uh, downbeat or you know, you know poor me kind of thing and I wanted to bring something a bit more positive a bit more wholesome a bit more fun uh, so that was one of the goals and the other one is to um, you know educate people uh, not even necessarily about oh if you watch my film you will know everything about autism ever you'll know every autistic person definitely not it's 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 not a biographical piece it's more specifically about me as an autistic person um, but hopefully that, uh, that if you do learn something useful and it applies to someone you know who's also autistic, then that's great. Um, and I guess the third one would probably be, um, I hope people have fun and laugh and, uh, and uh, enjoy it, basically. That's just it. I think you've Thank achieved you. your goals. Um, I'm going to do one more round of questions uh, to, to the group. But folks, if you have questions, of course, you can put them in the chat or raise your hand so we could call on you. And we'll start que taking questions from the audience. But um, Cameron, I'm going to start with you just, uh, just to ask you. Um, you mentioned um, how you wanted to also make a film about your friends. And, um, and, and first of all, I love that the film is in first person and it's positive and it's your experience and it's so open and shares and, and gives, gives us such an insight into your world. Um, what had changed that allowed you to have friends? Uh, allowed to have friends? That, you, that allowed you, you said that you didn't always, that this wasn't always the, the situation. Oh sure. Um, so, so so what did what did my friends impact me? Is that the question? What what changed that allowed you to to then to now have friends? If if that was something that didn't always come easy for you. Sorry, I'm not sure if I quite understand the question. Um, could you rephrase it if that's possible? Sure, I'll try. Um, um, if at the beginning of the film you said that having friends wasn't always easy. And that wasn't something that always came to you so easily. So um, if at I, first it was, yeah. It's, it's, I'm, I'm a pretty odd case because I am quite social. It's just, it's just, I think what I was trying to communicate is it's just, you meet the right people. So for example, the university I'm in is an art university. So I'm surrounded by art, surrounded by like-minded people. It's meeting the right people, being in the right environment. And so you can grow and, you know, work on your passions, work on your future goals, you know, to, uh, I hope to make a living through animation, do, you know, working on my dreams and stuff. My friends have helped me in terms, because um, I'm currently studying in Farnham, Surrey, which is in the UK, and uh, it's quite a small town, and uh, combining with the rural town, and also with my friends, I'm able to basically work my way around places and do things independently that most people would take for granted. And uh, yeah, I, I, think, I think I've always wanted to learn. I've always wanted to socialize. That's always been in me ever since, uh, um, I, I guess, uh, before I could even speak because I was nonverbal. I'm classically autistic. Uh, I had to communicate for drawing. 
So um, fortunately, there were a few good people that could recognize that, and I was able to get into um, education and then and then and then develop and then develop my skills and so on. So I hope that answered your question. Uh, it was a good question. Just had to <laughs> Very think much about so. it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and, and I'm sure you'll have a, a really bright future with animation because uh, it's it, you do a fantastic job. Um, Camille, I'm going to jump back into into what you were saying before, as far as um, uh, the film kind of um, reaching uh, beyond the borders of, uh, and, and I mean, you name the film Coexist and you keep putting into the film um, uh, these news um, portions from the radio. Can you tell us a little bit about those choices? Why, why you chose the name Coexist and, um, and uh, why you wanted to put the radio in there? I know it, it connects a little bit to what you were saying before. So uh, as for the name Coexist is, uh, and nowadays, even in the island, uh, this coexisting with nature is something is, it was, it was in traditionally, it was always like this, but nowadays with change of the culture, these kind of things are uh, not appreciated and not practicing anymore, more and less. Uh, but um, uh, I try to, I try to portray a man who is practicing coexisting with the nature. Uh, so that was the main thing was for me, was the how he, this man using elements of the nature and bring it a bread in a bread and they share together and even share it a little bit with a, a cat in uh, his room, in his house and uh, like, kind of living like peacefully with his environment, his amazing environment. But at the same time, yes, like uh, coexist in a general term that how we can coexist together. Um, the news uh, was, as mentioned, is like, for me, this, um, this man, his everyday life was in contrast with uh, what, uh, the, what the image and the portrait that he got and the information that they get in from the domestic news and also international news. So it's always, um, at, even for Iranians who haven't visited uh, Hormoz Island, it looks like a kind of some people might think that it's just a military base, it's a big military base because it's always talking about this Strait of Hormoz is important and we don't let, I don't know, blah, 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 blah. But I even don't want to repeat what they say. But, um, and, um, and so, so for this, uh, our, for Dela, the old man, he also keep hearing this news here and there. But um, at the end of the movie, like in one part, when he is still hearing the news and he changed the channel and listened to a, Amazing Iranian singer was was my favorite also, and uh, just uh, decide to listen to a, a music rather than news, and also the sound of the nature itself. Uh, so that's that was the idea behind this name and the movie. Thank you, thank you. Um, I'm going to move over to the Karen team now, and and actually, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, also, I guess, about the title and and uh, Karen, and this uh, this concept and the part that plays in the film. I don't think we've we've talked too much about that up until now. Um, um, I don't I know. Think if... that I probably should take that. Um, okay, <laughs> you can start, because... but, but I'd really like the film, also the filmmakers, to join in and and share a little bit about your inclusion of that in the film. Well. Karen, when I came out of my coma, I did not know anyone. My mind was completely erased. Uh, I didn't know my parents or anything. And um, standing in the room was another being, a hallucination, obviously. And years later, I mean, years later, during my childhood, this being just became sort of a friend. You know, children have 
these imaginary friends. And this imaginary friend, <clears throat> uh, I started calling Karen about, uh, I was about eight or nine years old, because Karen used to take me away when my parents would beat me up. He would take me someplace else. We would go on the back of some giant crow and fly all across these beautiful valleys. In fact, that's in the movie. <clears throat> and um, so Karen has been with me as an advisor, uh, if you want to call it an undifferentiated part of myself, whatever you want to call it. But Karen is why I'm here today. She has saved my life on numerous occasions uh, that are pointed out in some other books. And um, that's why that's where the title of the film comes from, My Spirit Guide, Charon. And um, without her, him, it, it, it's in three forms. Um, I wouldn't be here talking to you. I'd have been dead years and years and years ago. Because the epilepsy itself is so, so devastating. And the stigma is so bad that um, you just get to a place where you just don't want to face it anymore. I mean, when you don't know, when you wake up and you don't know where you are, you don't know what year it is, you don't know anything. And that can go on for hours in my case, sometimes wow. 12 hours. You don't know, you, you're just lost and alone. Well, I had Karen to come and help me through those times. And whether you want to call this a psychological manifestation like Carl Jung does, or whether you want to call it a spiritual one like, like the Buddhists do, then you, that's up to you. But the fact of it is, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you if Karen had not existed in my life and saved it, because Karen has saved my life on so many occasions. Um, and that's why the film is called Karen, because of that. And it's important to note, actually, that the film, I thought, was also, I mean, when we're talking about on the real abilities level, this is a film about mental health as well, um, and not just about um, epilepsy. And I think that's, right. that's, there's a lot of important messages there. That's right. Um, just to the filmmakers for a moment, did you guys want to add anything to that? Yeah, I think, I think Karan, we had kind of always knew was going to be the title of the film, just from the very beginning. Um, I was yeah, curious. And, and, and including Charon just as a as, as 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 really a character in the film. Along this, you can consider Myron's epilepsy even a character. Um, you know, having having that as as a three line is really important. I, I was I was curious to why um, Karen spelt with a C H and. Uh... Maybe Myron, you could share how you know that it's a, with a CH. That's the way um, I'd already, I'd always seen it that way. When I, when I was starting to write, you know, when I went to school and learned to, learned to write. And uh, I just started spelling it C-H-A-R-O-N. And, and um, I mean, the last part of Caron is the last part of my own name, R-O-N. So, um, there's that, there's that maybe, but the fact is that, that uh, um, I yeah. just start, I just started, uh, and besides, Carol, it, it's not, it's not to be confused with the, with the Carol who takes people across the river sticks and through pathology. That's a different being completely, has nothing to do with the Carol that helps mind and soul, as you would say, that, you know, an undifferentiated part of myself, but, um, the fact is that, that uh, I spelled it that way and it always ended up being spelled that way. Even though people call it Charon and all kinds of interesting pronunciations, I always called it Charon. So, um, so that's the reason that, that Charon is spelled the way it is. That's the way I started spelling it when I was about eight years old. Started writing about it. Ryan, did you want to add to it? Just about why the film is called Karen or? or and to Karen's part in the film. Uh, well, this, this project actually started out as a, we had actually made an earlier version of the film uh, as a student film that was like shorter and we weren't able to really sort of elaborate so much on Karen's role. So uh, this movie is actually technically a remake 
of a you know when we had better equipment and stuff to, to sort of redo the vision that we initially had as college students so um, I know like one of the things we were trying to do was you know was trying to make care on a character so I feel like this version of the film uh, is more representative of that than you know just Myron's uh, initial story yeah well yeah one more thing I'll, I'll add to that um because we we go through we cover throughout the film we go we cover so much of Myron's life his his childhood is um you know his kind of, his sort of youth early early adulthood um these that um kind of lost time for him and we get to um we get to follow his relationship with Caron through all of those all of those beats uh, so I think that that helps, you know, develop M Myron. It, sh it helps it helps kind of track Myron's Myron's journey as well to have Caron be there uh, throughout all of it. Fascinating. Um, I I want to just before we open it to questions from uh, the audience, just I wanted to ask um, Hal and Minter's team uh, one more question, which was um, um, really to you, Hal the um, you were talking about how your art has changed. And um, I'm wondering if you were always so deadpan and if the, um, if the, um, the epilepsy actually has played into that at all and how else your art has changed. And feel free all of you from the team to, to chime in. Well, I, I was um, about 15 years ago, I was on spoken word. HBO and um, and a speech teacher. There was a table me before me, and and the speech teacher showed me that even though I wasn't diagnosed with Parkinson, uh, my speech was part was a Parkinson was for Parkinson symptom. And and a fact, and um, and um, I always wanted to say that that less is more than being an artist is no when to stop, and 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 I don't think I ever wrote, wrote a poem longer than longer than a page, and um, that's all I have to say. Now, what is it? Yeah, yeah. Um, when Hal was a teenager, he was a stutterer. Um, he so so. What was really interesting when he was talking about his speech therapy? Um, that was a brilliant question, by the way, because he was known for his deadpan poetry delivery. I mean, everyone described him as that. That would be a an adjective to describe Hal, but we realized later that the, the, the look on his face the, the, and his deadpan delivery, a lot of it was from the Parkinson's. In fact, even before he even knew he had Parkinson's. So, um, so it's, that was a really interesting question. Um, and, 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 then, and then the fact that he was a stutterer. Um, so, so, um, so anyway, but, but, but one thing that with his writing that's interesting is one way that's affected his writing is that he has micrographia, which is um, a lot of people with Parkinson's have it, which is um, really, really small handwriting. Um, so the message from the hand, you know, the brain to the hand doesn't get to, so he's, so that's really a challenging for him is not being able to read his handwriting. Um, but I don't know, is that answer your question? Very, very much so. Um... Ram, did you want to add in anything? No, I think they said it perfectly. Great. We're going to take some questions from the audience. Sorry, folks, we only have a few minutes. We're going to start with Betty and Bill. Um, Betty and Bill, you're on the air. Okay, you answered our first question. So we're going to go to the second question. And that is, what was your favorite part of doing the film? And why was that your favorite part? And the, the, the favorite part was hanging out with my friends and with my wife 
and then they had the camera on, and I could just be my be myself. Yeah, Hal, Hal said hanging out with his poet friends. So his poet friends are a real highlight of the film. Hearing them talk about Hal and his poetry. These are friends he's known for, you know, 30 years or more that are really, he has really close friends. And um, so just talking about, you know, them seeing his, you know, remembering when he was diagnosed and all that. So that was one of my favorite parts too. But I have to add that I also really love the part with our dog, <laughs> not to be a dog person, but um, I loved having my, our dog captured in film and she actually died last week. So, um, oh. so now she will be forever on film. So I, hey, I had to plug my dog for a minute. So good question, Betty. <laughs> um, okay. We got one from Joan. Joan, you're on the air. Joan, we can't hear you. Hold on. Please unmute. Joan, you're, you're, you're muted. Oh, maybe now. No, she's still muted. Joan, let's come back to you, if that's okay. Oh, she got it. My, my you got one it? There you go. You're yes. on. You're on. It wasn't working. Sorry. Um, I just wanted to say about Hal and Minter movie. Um, I really like how he intermixed, you know, a day in the life of Hal and um, the interviews and, um, you know, Hal's poetry. And I just want to know, did he have that idea from the beginning or did he just film and then kind of come up with it, doing it that technique or way? Well, uh I mean, I, I, I actually was very inspired by, um, you know, Woody Allen from the 70s, you know, not the Woody Allen now, but from the 70s and uh, um, like uh, Annie Hall and all those things. And I really wanted to sort of capture those moments between them. I mean, I always knew I would get the poetry because, again, the idea of, of a spoken word poet losing his voice, but being very creative was critical. And, and his poetry, I mean, I actually wanted if, if I had a budget, I would have gone further. I actually did a call out for Jewish moms and uh, to be like various Jewish mothers to sort of play these roles and read the poems themselves. Uh, but COVID happened and that got all canceled. So um, there was a lot of other ambitious things we wanted to do. Thank you. Um, we have a question here from LJ for Myron. Um, Myron, um, first of all, I, uh, did you always know that Sharon, that Karen was not real, or could you and, and or could not be seen by others? And how old were you when? Um, sorry, what was the question there? Um, did you? Um, what age were you when you began to speak? There we go. Uh, <clears throat> before. Uh, what they call pre-lapsarian. Before I, I went into the coma, uh, I was already speaking and playing the piano. So I was all, in fact, after the, after the coma was over and I'd forgotten everything else, music penetrated the coma. And um, uh, but Charon is, is not, uh, I don't consider Charon an imaginary creature. Um, I consider Karen, uh, uh, depending on how you want to de define angel or spiritual guide or whatever word you want to use, even if it's psychological, like you talked about. But um, I began to speak after the after the coma. I my speech was retarded uh, because I couldn't remember anything about. Um, about how things worked. At least that's what everybody tells me. I, mean, I don't remember very much about it, but what I was told was that my speech, it took a long time for my speech to return. And um, so I could start talking. And then of course they were always making the joke. <laughs> Once I started talking, I never shut up. And um, that's probably true. But um, the, the real problem was that I transferred all of my 
love and, and acceptance and home life to Kara, not because I didn't know my parents. I didn't know who they were. And then since they were abusing me, uh, I needed a, another friend. And I couldn't yeah. go to the state or the or anybody. We had a nurse across the street, Mrs. Amiot, and she used to come over and treat me when they would beat me up. Well, today they would report that. Well, they didn't report it back in the 1940s and 50s. And um, so Karen was the only friend I really had. And, uh, and when you're young, you know, she was treating me like a child, you know, we were just playing. And as I got older, she began to teach me things. In fact, without Karen, there would be no art. I started doing my art um, to record my visions because um, I was going to be a musician. And then I got hurt uh, and couldn't play anymore. And I thought my life was over. And then Caroline said, well, then why don't you start drawing since you do you have visions? So I started drawing. And it's 40 years later and, and I've got all this art and I still do it today. I did some this morning. And when this is over, I'll do some more this evening. But it's a record of all of my visions and experiences. That's what the art is. And, uh, and that's why all the books that have been published about the art, it, that's what it's about. And the art is always about epilepsy and the experiences of epilepsy and about Caron being my spirit guide, which, which is essential to my life. I mean, I love her dearly, dearly. Thank you. Thank you. I want to throw in one more question. Um, Cameron, actually, um, uh, um, LJ's question was actually to you as far as um, at what age did you start speaking? Hey, no problem. Um, so uh, I started to, I guess, kind of speak when I was six, but, uh, you know, I needed to start somewhere. It was mainly gibberish, but but I think, uh, but of course, I, I attribute um my speaking abilities to like my mom and, and all that, all that good stuff. Uh, but, um, but bef obviously before, like I said, before I could speak, I used to draw to communicate my feelings and my thoughts and all that stuff. And, uh, and, um, and uh, I think that naturally led me to do animation because I could think in pictures and could illustrate. And, uh, and obviously I, I, through that skill and uh, yeah, like I said, naturally led me to animation. Thank you. Nice, thank you. Um, before we sign off, one last question to Camille. Camille, has the film been shown back on the island? Uh, no, not really. As far as I know, <laughs> I, I didn't go back there and, uh, but the thing is I invited Della and his family in like my home city in Iran and uh, they came to my home city in very like about uh, almost 2000 kilometers away from that island and they come and they spend some time together but the movie hasn't uh, shown in the island. Maybe soon. Um, folks, we are out of time, but I want to thank all of you, all the amazing filmmakers, the beautiful films. Um, tell your friends to see these amazing films. They're really quite extraordinary. Um, uh, up next, our next Q&A is at 8 p.m. for the film Crutch. Please join us for that. And then tomorrow we have at uh, 2 p.m. Shorts 4. If you haven't seen those yet, this is a good time to catch up. We'll give you a few hours of rest. Um, and then we have an industry panel at 4 p.m. Um, with what we're calling the Game Changers, some of the um, exciting voices um, in front of and behind the camera these days um, in the disability world. And then at 6 p.m., a Q&A for the film, The Special. So please join us for that. We're, of course, going on till Wednesday with many more conversations, events, and screenings. Thank you to all of our partners, to all the wonderful filmmakers, and to all of you for being here and being a part. Have a good night and stay safe, everyone. Thank you very much.